Good morning. I'm glad that you all are here. The subject before us today is a very big subject. When they first assigned it to me, I was like, how in the world am I going to fill up 45 minutes? And I started studying, and I'm like, I could spend 45 minutes on one little bit of the subject. So we're going to try to go through it pretty fast, hopefully not too fast. So, but relating to the church, as I began thinking about and studying for this subject, um, the song Channels Only kept going through my head. You will find that song in your booklet so you can follow along as I read it. I would like for us to picture ourselves as a channel as we read the song. Jesus flows through us and we don't want any bit of self to hinder that flowing. Here's the song. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Emptied that thou shouldest fill me, a clean vessel in thine hand, with no, po- with no strength but as thou givest, graciously with each command, witnessing thy power to save me, setting free from self and sin. Thou who boughtest to, pos- to possess me in thy fullness, Lord, come in. Jesus, fill now with thy spirit, hearts that full surrender know that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow. And then the chorus, channels only, blessed master, but with all thy wondrous power, flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. As Jesus saves, cleanses, and fills us, he flows through us. Our lives can be a refreshing balm for all who encounter us. Jesus uses us for for his glory when he flows through us. We must be set free from self and sin have surrendered hearts and realize that it is only in his strength that we can be his channel. I tend to be a visual person, so I often think in pictures, and I love to think of myself as a lamp, and the light inside of me is God, and self is just the shade. And if myself, my shade is thick, only a little bit of light can get through. But if it's thin like it should be, the light can come through very clearly. And as we go through the subject of relating to the church, I would like for us to keep in mind the importance of self being thin. God must be able to flow and shine through us brightly or our living will be in vain. I would also like for us to think about the importance of being all in for God. We cannot hold back bits and pieces of our lives and hearts for ourselves. God must have everything. If God has all of us, he can use us in great ways to serve his church. But if we hold back, reserving parts for self and sin, the channel gets gets clogged and, we, and he can't throw, flow through us. A long time ago in the city of Jerusalem lived a lady whom we will call Anna. She was a widow and she was very poor. Anna loved the Lord and served him with all her heart. She did whatever she could to give to God and others, but to her it never seemed like much. Every time she went to the temple to worship, she left with a sad heart. As she watched countless people put money in the treasury, she cried. How she longed to have something to give to God. Anna already lived as simply as possible, but she purposed in her heart to somehow find a way to give a bit of money to God. And so she ate less. Her clothes wore patches upon the patches. She worked harder. Slowly, slowly, she saved first one coin and then another. One lovely Sabbath morning, Anna awoke early and felt excitement tingle through her body. Today was the day. She dressed quickly, hiding her two small coins in a deep inner pocket, and headed out to the temple. Today, finally, Anna had something tangible to give to God. As she neared the treasury, her feet slowed and her head lowered. Just in front of her, she noticed three wealthy men casting in money. More money than Anna had ever seen in her whole life. Her two coins were nothing absolutely nothing compared to this richness. And then, to her greater dismay, she noticed the the famous rabbi named Jesus sitting behind the treasury, watching people cast in their money. How could she walk up and give her tiny amount when his eyes were on her? Anna almost turned and walked away, still clutching the coins, but a sudden strength gripped her, and she walked up to the treasury, slipped in in the two coins, and prayed that God would accept her humble offering. Oh, it was so little, but it was all she had. And then, what was that she heard? She turned slightly and saw Jesus smile kindly at her. He turned to his disciples and spoke. Anna clung to every word. Truly, I say to you, this widow has cast in more than all the others. 
Anna couldn't believe her ears. But wait, he was still speaking. For the rich of their abundance have given money, but this woman, this woman has given everything she has. And I did take major writer's liberties with that story. But I want Anna to be a little personal to you. Put yourself in, your, in her shoes. You know what the little bit is that you have. Give it to God. He will accept your gift with love, and you yourself will be blessed. And I said this before, but I want you to think about this a lot as we go through this topic. Be all in. Give all to God. Don't hold anything back. Be a channel that he can flow through without any hindrance. So who are we in the body of Christ? Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 6 and 2, 19 refer to this. We are accepted in the beloved. We are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. A place to belong and feelings of acceptance are things I strive for in life. I hate going places where I know I'll be on the outside edge instead of the inner circle. But as Christ's bride, we all belong. We are completely accepted. We are known and loved. We are chosen and complete. Many of us tend to feel insignificant and like we have nothing to give to others. In reality, each of us is vital and important. God placed you in your church for a specific reason, to supply something that your church lacks. You are there for God's glory and for the good of others. The devil loves to tell us that we must be like so-and-so in order to be used in the church, that only the most special gifts and noticeable talents are valued. You know what God tells us? Let's look at Ephesians 4, verses 1 through, 11, through 8, and then we'll drop down to verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the voc vocation wherewith you are called, with loneliness, lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of God. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now verse 11, and he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all come in the unity of faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the, full, of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they wait, lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compact, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. In order for the church to be complete and effective, we need each member. We need different gifts. We need you to be who God called you to be. The goal for these differences is the church is for the church to be edified, perfected, and fitly joined together. You are important because God created you. And what is our calling in the church? Ephesians 1:12 sums it up well that we should be to the praise of his glory. For this we were created, for this we were redeemed. That is the ultimate calling in life. God has placed on us the tremendous honor of being his glory. We are supposed to be Jesus' hands and feet to a watching world. One, to, one way of doing this is to relate well in the church and love each other. When people see how you relate in the church, do they see Jesus in your life? We are also called to submit one to another. Submission means yielding to the authority of will or will of another. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. The church is supposed to be a thing of immense beauty. The purpose of the church is to show a watching world how wonderfully relationships can work, and how much God loves his people. 
Sadly, so often church life is just the opposite. And why is that? I think it's because when God has a beautiful thing going, the devil tries to attack that. And by allowing his attacks on the church, we are actually listening to Satan instead of God. We are human, and the church is made up of humans just like us. We will not be perfect. But our goal in life should be to portray God and his love as closely as possible. Imagine with me that you have a lovely flower garden. You take very good care of it, tending it carefully. You pull the weeds, you water, you prune, you fertilize, and it makes your heart very happy when you see the beautiful flowers. Now picture the disappointment you would feel if one day you were walking through your garden and you found all the flowers dying and the weeds thriving instead. Our hearts can be like that garden. God works very closely with us, creating us a, in us a beauty that gives him joy. But we have the tendency to allow big, ugly weeds to grow and choke out those lovely flowers. And I would like to talk to you about five of those weeds that can hinder our flourishing in the church. And then we will discuss five characteristics that identify, intensify church beauty. So the first weed is jealousy. And jealousy is kind of the big weed that sends out lots of little roots. So this is a very important one. Webster's defines jealousy as a painful awareness of another's possessions or advantages and a desire to have them too. Jealousy is often sneaky. It creeps in when we are looking the other direction. We don't have to be intentional about those jealous feelings, they just come. The biblical term for jealousy is often covetousness or envy. It is one of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, 17 says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his os, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And I think the key, key phrase in that verse for us today is, Thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's. Luke 12, 15 warns us, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. And I think often for us ladies, it's not the possessions as much as what our sisters in the church are, or how they look, or maybe their marital status. We're jealous over their, fra their fame, success, honor, looks, and abilities. We long for the position they have, or the talents they were blessed with, we want the relationships they enjoy with others. We see everything they are and everything we are not and focus on that. It can make us extremely insecure. It can kill all the joy in our hearts. It can lead to depression and bitterness. And your bad attitude can literally dest destroy group relationships. Unfortunately, bad attitudes are contagious. Sometimes jealousy expresses itself in being critical. We feel like we will never measure up. So if we can find something they are doing wrong, we feel better about ourselves. We peer at their lives with a magnifying glass, honing in on every little fault and blowing it way out of proportion. So maybe we should check our, our own lives when we feel very critical <laughs> towards some and someone and see if it's actually jealousy that's coming out. Jealousy can be comical when portrayed in children. When two of my nieces were about three and six, they struggled a lot with this. The one would, would peer sorrowfully in the mirror and say, my face just isn't as pretty as Julie's. Add a few years to that tender age and jealousy is horribly unattractive. Jealousy let to itself would destroy relationships and lead you to places you never thought you would go. Galatians 5.26 tells us, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. If you are struggling with jealousy, confess it to God. Don't dwell on those feelings toward the other person. Do some intentional good toward the person you're having issues with. Focus on truth and pray this prayer from Psalm 119. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Focusing on God and his word is a wonderful, wonderful cure for those jealous feelings. 
Weed number two is pride. The sin of pride is an excess, excessive preoccupation with self and one's own importance, achievements, status, or possessions. The sin is considered rebellion against God because it gives honor and glory to oneself that only God should have. God hates pride. Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate pride, hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. When we give credit to ourselves over stuff that we have no control over, we are robbing God of glory. He chose to give us life, to bless us, to give us what we have and are. We are nothing without God. He's the one who created your body, gave you your voice, gifted you with those special abilities. When you use these things for his glory, he is honored. It's not about sitting in a corner somewhere and never doing anything that you're good at, nor is it denying that you do have a special talent in a certain area, but it's all about your attitude towards yourself. False humility is actually pride as well. Sometimes the fear of hurting our pride keeps us from actually serving well. If we can't do it perfectly, we won't do it at all. Anything that places you in the center and not God is pride. The letter I is in the middle of the word pride, and that's how it is in life as well. It's all about me. I think this quote puts it very well. Humility is not thinking less of oneself. It's thinking of oneself less. And I'll repeat that. Humility is not thinking less of oneself. It is thinking of oneself less. If we forget about ourselves and throw our lives out for others, it will greatly reduce the pride problem. When we have an elevated view of ourselves, we are setting ourselves up for shame and embarrassment. Just suppose you would brag to others about your driving abilities and how careful you are. You would have never gotten a speeding ticket. And you just don't understand how reckless some people can be. What would happen if the very next day you hit an icy patch and you totaled your car? You would feel much shame. Proverbs 11.2 puts it this way, When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Here's a few more verses on that. Proverbs 29.23, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Proverbs 16.18, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 21, 4, a, hot, a high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. The scriptures say that pride deceives the heart, hardens the mind, brings contention, compasses about like a chain, brings men to destruction, stirs up strife, causes one to stumble and fall, and for these and many other reasons, the scripture says that pride is an abomination to the Lord. God resists the proud and hates the proud look. And there is a proud look. The raised eyebrow, the chin jutting out, the downturned, slightly drawn lips, the long nose over which the eyes look down on you. We say a person who is prideful looks down his nose at you. That's what pride is. It's looking down on others from a position of supposed importance. C.S. Lewis makes a great observation about this. He says, as long as you are looking down at others, you cannot know God. Because as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Pride can be revealed in so many different ways. Be alert to the ways that it's revealed in you. It's going to be different for many of us. Maybe it's through flaunting your perfect three-layer chocolate cake with salted caramel icing at a church event. Maybe it's through sharply criticizing a friend who admitted a struggle to you. Perhaps it's showing you taking charge of a birthday party because you want everything to go your way. Maybe it's through refusing to participate in an event or game because you know you won't be as good at it as the next person beside you. 
Or maybe it's through your refusal to sit beside a certain sister in church because her off-key alto hinders your own clear soaring soprano. So be alert to the way pride is expressed in your life. We number three is gossip. And as I was studying for this topic, I had to think of my coworkers at work. Sometimes people have a juicy little story to tell and they're like, oh, this is gossip. And we're like, oh, tell us, we love gossip. <laughs> and it's not wrong to repeat stories sometimes, but I think it's the intention of the heart. The sin of gossip is burying bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart. Nipping gossip in the bud will not only improve your reputation as a Christian, but it will also contrib contribute to the health of the church. If I'm honest, it's easier speaking about someone's life rather than my own. I can even get a little joy out of hearing someone else's problems. For a moment, it seems like my life is better than someone else's. I can even indulge in the spiritual high of knocking someone, el someone else off their pedestal in hopes to keep me on my pedestal and it doesn't work. Have you ever thrived even a little bit on the idea that someone who is, who on the exterior is prettier, thinner, or better than you is crumbling on the interior? Maybe you hear a story about someone who you are really struggling with or someone who has done wrong to you. The carnal part of us loves to magnify the bad in that person and repeat their faults or shame to all who will listen. Sometimes we use gossip as a revenge. Our words have power. God used words when he spoke the world into being. Jesus used them to calm storms, heal the sick, and rebuke the Pharisees. They can have a positive or negative effect on people, depending on how we choose to use them. Gossip can be used as backstabbing people as well. We can be ever so nice to their face, pretending to be a close friend to gain their confidence, only to turn around and blast their name to others. Don't do it. Resist that temptation. It's cruel, it's painful, and it destroys you and the, the others around you. Who wants to be a friend to a person you can't trust? Here are four things to ask yourself before repeating a story or starting one. Number one. Would the person be offended if they heard you said it? Gossip rears its ugly head when we talk about our sister, especially if she isn't there to defend herself. If the person you were speaking about walked into the room, would the person be embarrassed at what you were saying? Would you? Two, is it factual or just a rumor? Rumors you hear about others are just that, rumors. Not only can spreading false information ruin their reputation, but it can ruin yours. Number three, could the person you speak of trust you with additional information after you, after you spread this information? You could destroy the trust between you and the other person if she finds out that you aired her dirty laundry. And number four, would you be offended if someone said that about you? A good rule of thumb when it comes to what we say is to ask yourself if you would want it said about you. If you wouldn't, then chances are that person wouldn't want it said about them either. We are commanded in scripture to love our neighbors as ourselves. That includes all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Weed number four is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is defined as feigning to be what one is not or to believe what one does not, behavior that contradicts what one claims to believe or feel. Matthew 23, 28 brings out this definition clearly. Even so you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. One of the greatest deceptive strategies of the devil is the use of hypocrisy. It is living a fake life. It is appearing to be holy and sinless while in the heart is a different story altogether. Hypocrisy is making others believe something that is not true. It is lying to people, not just with words, but with one's very life. 
You may succeed in lying to every single person on earth, but a lie can never become true, no matter the number of people who have come to believe it. Ananias and Sapphira are examples of hypocrisy, of pretending things that are not true. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts 5. Acts 5, verses 1 through 11. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye have sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt this, the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. This couple was not killed because they were not generous enough. God's judgment was brought upon them swiftly because they were pretending something that wasn't true. So be real, be authentic. Never try to deceive anyone by giving a false impression of yourself. Dare to show the true you even when it's scary. And I love to paint a picture perfect picture of myself to my friends and not expose where I've failed or where I'm struggling. Honestly, I'm very afraid of being vulnerable. I'm afraid of what people will think of me if I confess that I struggle in certain areas. But there is such a freedom in admitting my struggles with trusted friends, and it actually deepens relationships. Ask for prayer when you need it. We are all here for each other, and that's what church life really should be about, helping and caring for each other. Our churches need more real people. Dare to be one. And the last weed is comparison. Do you often compare yourself to other people? Have you ever thought of the consequences of doing that? It is very easy for us to fall into that trap. And usually when we compare ourselves to others, we come out to one of three conclusions. One, we are better than they are. Two, they are better than we are. Three, we'd rather be them than us. I'm sure you remember the parable of the, of the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee thought he was better than everyone else, and especially the sinful publican, because he compared his outward appearance to others and concluded he was a really good guy. The tax collector, on the other hand, recognized his need and asked God for mercy. Jesus said that God heard the prayer, the prayer of the tax collector, but not the prayer of the, of the Pharisee. And how often do we, like the Pharisee, compare outward appearances and end up thinking we're either pretty good stuff or else we're nothing at all? Whenever God creates, he does it with intention. We, are, we were created with intention. The flaws we see in our bodies, in our personalities, and our abilities are not flaws to God. If we continually compare ourselves to the people around us, we miss the opportunity to build others up and bring glory to God in what we can do. Jesus' disciples were no strangers to comparison. Remember how Peter asked Jesus right after Jesus had given him his, his life purpose, what John was supposed to do? Jesus' answer to Peter is the same answer to us, I believe. What is that to you? Follow thou me. 
Peter and John both served very important but different roles in the early church. They were both needed, just in unique areas. Don't look at your sister in the church as a threat. Think of her as a blessing. She fills roles and supplies areas that you are not able to succeed in. I also give you a challenge. Compliment the people you're comparing yourself with. Compliment them especially in the area you are struggling with. It's hard to do, but when we turn our comparisons into a way to build someone else up, the devil loses and God is glorified. Now let's take a look at positive things we can do in relating to others. Here are five characteristics that promote church beauty. The first one is love. For the church to work as one body, its members must commit to loving one another as Christ has loved us. Church life requires selfless acts of grace, honor, and respect. It requires commitment. The result is a glorious union founded on and fueled by the depths of God's love for us. The church should be known by its love. Jesus said, by this will all men know that ye are my disciples if you have loved one for another. John 13, 35. And what does this type of love look like? Scripture gives us the answer. The most comprehensive description of love is found in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul shines love through a prism and we can look at its colors and hues. Each ray gives us a different view of what is called agape love. <clears throat> the passage does not focus so much on what love is, but what love does and does not do. Agape love is active, not abstract or passive. It does not simply feel patient. It is patient. It practices patience. It does not simply have kind feelings. It does kind things. Love is fully love only when it acts. Scripture tells us, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 1 John 3, 18. Let's look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 in bite-sized pieces. This will help us to understand it better and to apply it in a practical way. So the first one is love is patient. The word patient literally means long-tempered. This word is common in the New Testament, and it is used almost exclusively in being patient with people rather than circumstances or events. Love patience is the ability to be inconvenienced or taken advantage of by a person over and over again. Stephen's last words were those of patient forgiveness. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. As he lay dying, his concern was for his murderers rather than for himself. This is the love that Jesus speaks about that turns the other cheek. Its primary concern is for the welfare of others, not itself. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 say, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on, its, on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. <clears throat> love is kind. Just as patience will take anything from others, kindness will give anything to others. To be kind means to be useful, serving, and gracious. It is active goodwill. It not only feels generous, it <clears throat> is generous. It not only desires others' welfare, it works for it, and God is our supreme model in this. Next is love does not envy, and we already talked about jealousy. There are two kinds of envy. First, we want what someone else has. If they have a better car, house, or job, we secretly wish we had the same. Two, we wish that someone else didn't have what they had. This is more than just selfishness. It is desiring evil for someone else. There will always be someone out there doing better than you. You can either live with it and be content with such things as you have, 
or you can be eaten up with envy. Next, love does not parade itself. In other words, love does not brag or parade its accomplishments. Bragging is the other side of envy. Envy is wanting what someone else has. Bragging is trying to make others envy what you have. Love does not remind a person of the great sacrifice you have made for them or of how good of a job you have done. Love does not behave rudely. True love has good manners. That is something that is largely lost in our world today. But love cares about others and is mannerly. Love will respect others enough to lay down self, even when we personally don't think it's that big of an issue. Love does not seek its own. This speaks of the aspect of fallen nature where we always want to have our own way. The world should revolve around us, we think. Love makes the world revolve around others, not us. Love is not easily provoked. To provoke means to arouse anger or sudden outburst. Love guards against being irritated, upset, or angered by things others said or did, and will also go out of its way not to provoke others. Love believes all things. In other words, love believes the best about every person. It is not suspicious or cynical. If a loved one is accused of something wrong, love will consider him or her innocent until proven guilty. You will stick up for them. Love is loyal. Do your friends know that they can count on you when they need you? Love endures all things. It refuses to give up, to stop believing or hoping. Love will simply not stop loving. Number two is gratitude. Gratitude is a feeling of appreciation and thankfulness for blessings or benefits we have received. As we cultivate a grateful attitude, we are more likely to be happy and spiritually strong. We should regular, regularly express our gratitude to God for the blessings he gives us. I work as a graphic designer and I've often been amazed at how ungrateful people can be. So I work long hours on a job and often work overtime because they forgot their deadline and so the designer can just do it. And some people literally don't even thank me for the project. They just find the mistakes. And I remember one time I was really complaining about it and I was instantly convicted because that's how I treat God way too often. He does so much for me and I, I can turn around and just grumble, complain. I should thank him for his good gifts even if it's not what I want. It's best for me. And I also need to remember to thank him when he answers a prayer. Learn to express gratitude to other people as well. Take time to notice people and all the things they do for you. And after you notice it, thank them. A compliment or a word of appreciation means so much. It's easy to focus on the negative in life. We often see what others are doing wrong and forget to notice what they are doing right. Train yourself to show gratitude to others. Gratitude gives to others, but also also benefits ourselves. I remember one time I was feeling very discouraged and I started complaining to God and telling him everything that was wrong. And when I was done with that, I came up with a list of blessings and it was amazing at how much faster the blessings came than the trials. And afterward, I felt so much better. I was like, I need to do that more often when life looks like it's hopeless. I need to list my blessings because there are so many. A grateful heart will add joy to your face, make you a more pleasant person to be around, and brighten your outlook on life. Then the third one is compassion. The meaning of compassion is to recognize the suffering of others and then take action to help. Compassion is a tangible expression of love for those who are suffering. It also suffers with them. It doesn't leave your friends to bear the burden alone, but is willing to step in to help bear that burden. Let's take a look at Matthew 25 to see how Jesus feels about compassion. 
So Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth sheep from the goats. Verse 33. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for, me, for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also, unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angel angels. For I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered, or thirst, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, these ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Feeling sympathy for someone is a start, but it's not enough. Let compassion move you to action. There are countless ways to reach out to others in the church. Be alert to the needs around you. And here's just a few ways to get you started thinking about compassion. The first one I have is send. And this is one of my favorites. I've always loved cards and I've discovered what a ministry, ministry they can be. Through hard times in my life, I've learned firsthand what a rightly timed card can do for a person. I've also experienced the prompting of God to send a card only to later learn that it was just what the other person needed. You don't have to write much if you're not a writer. Just tell your friend you're thinking of her and praying for her. You can also send flowers, just because, if you have the resources to do so, or send some other thoughtful gift. The next one is listen. Be careful about asking prying questions when someone is going through a difficult thing, especially if you're not close friends. But learn to ask general questions like, how are you doing? If she wants to open up, she will. And if she opens up, listen. We often think we need to fix the problems by giving pet answers or good advice, and there is a time for that. But for the most part, a listening ear and an arm around the shoulders means more than all the words you can say. Remember, be quick to remember people's birthdays and other special days. If the anniversary, is, if the anniversary of a death is coming up, let your friend know that you remember. If someone shares a struggle with you, follow up. Ask her how she's doing. If you promise to pray, do it. It means so much to people if you continue praying after the initial heartbreak is passed. Stay connected to your friend. Don't let her walk the journey alone. The next one is invest. Each of us has the power to make a tremendous difference in the lives of others. Be willing to invest in lives. Invest in children. You don't have to be the candy lady at church in order to build relationships with children. Call them by name. Talk to them. Invest in young people. Invest in the elderly. Be willing to have friendships that are not your age. It adds a healthy balance to your life. And the next one is assist. There are multiple ways to help others. Maybe you love to cook. You can take a meal to someone. You can do grocery shopping for a shut-in or busy mother if that works better for you. Pull weeds, babysit, sew. Serving the Bride of Christ is one of the best ways to find fulfillment in your life. And your gift or meal certainly doesn't have to be perfect or elaborate. 
elaborate to be heartwarming. About a year and a half ago, my brother was involved in an accident and we were kept very busy driving to and from the hospital. And after he came home, we had lots of visitors coming and going. And one lady from church brought us a loaf of bread and a bucket of soup. And mom and I almost cried for joy over that. It meant so much. I'm sure our friend didn't think it was much, but to us it was huge. The fourth one is encouragement. When you encourage someone, you give him or her the power or con the courage or confidence to do something. Listen to your words for one day. Are you edifying people or tearing them down? Do people feel encouraged or discouraged when they leave your presence? Encouragement, encouragement is like oxygen in the life of a church. It keeps hearts beating, minds clear, and hands inspired to serve. When encouragement is absent from the life of a church, people feel unloved, unimportant, useless, and forgotten. Encouragement is shared with the hopes that it will lift someone's heart towards towards the Lord. It points out evidences of grace in another's life to help them see that God is using them. It points a person to God's promises that assures them that all they face is under his control. <coughs> Encouraging words have the potential to change lives and to echo in people's lives for years to come. Try to make encouragement a daily discipline. Set reminders for yourself if you need it. Write it on the calendar. You will never be sorry for every encouraging word you spoke. And the fifth and final is forgiveness. Our brothers and sisters in the church will hurt us. We will be wronged, misunderstood, and left out at times. The church is full of humans, and we will need to practice forgiveness often. When we take a look at how much God has forgiven us and the seriousness of not forgiving others, it should motivate us to desire God's way of forgiveness. It doesn't mean it will come easily. Often it requires us bringing the same thing to God over and over. And I just praise him that he does not weary of us bringing the same thing to him countless times. Here are four points to gospel-based forgiveness. One, forgiveness is an act of the will. Two, forgiveness is not a passive process of forgetting or letting something fade in the memory. Rather, it is an active process which involves a conscious choice and deliberate course of action. We draw on God's grace and decide not to think or talk about what others have done to hurt us. Forgiveness is not excusing by saying, it's okay, wasn't that big of a deal. Forgiveness is the opposite of excusing. Forgiveness says, yes, we both know that what you did was wrong, but since God has forgiven me, I will forgive you. Four, forgiveness can be costly and painful. Sometimes certain effects of, of a person's sins linger for quite a long time. You will have to fight against those painful memories, work on trusting the person, and sometimes you may have to deal with physical costs, such as finances or injury. But again, the forgiving heart will put the other person first and self last. In closing, I would like for us to think about what is awaiting us, the Bride of Christ. Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. Verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him night serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, 
neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. If we are faithful, we will be there. And that is going to be such a glorious day. I can't wait. It's beyond my wildest dreams, and I would not want to miss it. And I don't want any of you to miss it either. Let's be faithful in serving the bride of Christ here and make sure we are ready to live with them forever in heaven. Thank you, and God bless you.